I'm gonna make sure I watch the time here. Um, so I want to talk about it. This is an ongoing study. So, um, well, it's an ongoing study. We're still um, working on some stuff. So, um, but to show you uh, basically kind of the premise behind this, I like to start with this idea of how we're conceptualizing disability as far as the uh, uh, as a foundation for um, for this study. I'm looking at spatially equitable transportation. Um, we're conceptualizing disability as kind of a biopsychosocial model where every individual has um, functional competencies um, over on the left side of the continuum. And these are moving around a lot. I mean, we're all, we're all there. There's diversity of functional competency. And it's continually changing with time and circumstances and lots of different things, uh, impairment. Um, at the same time, every environment is placing a demand or functional demand on individuals. Um, and this changes as well as the environment changes. Um, but wherever there's a gap where the functional demand is higher than the functional competency of the individual, that's what a disability is as we look at it in this, as we conceptualize it in this way. Um, it changes the disability from being more uh, impairment driven to it's an experience. Uh, and uh, so in the, more of a social model of disability where you experience disability because of um, you know the misalignment of these two. Uh, so for example if you came to this conference and you're at the hotel and you don't have a car and need to get over here um, your functional competency might be below the functional demands of where the conference venue is and you may have experienced disability or basically a limitation on your ability to fully participate. It may have taken extra time or planning or, or resources or um, whatever it took in order to get here. Um, however, when we talk about people with disabilities per se, we're talking about individuals who are continually facing um, this misalignment. So they continually have this disability experience and they come to uh, identify and be identified by that misalignment as well. So we look at disability kind of this, or this study is based on disability uh, viewed in this framework. But, so I wanted to, to throw that out. So we're examining the, the meaning, nature, and consequence of the experience of disability as it's this construct of the interaction between the two. Um, as a, as basically as a background, individuals with dis, oh, I'm, I'm changing slides on the wrong thing. All right, so um, individuals with disabilities, uh, when we talk about big D disability or individuals with disabilities, are often marginalized. Um, and there's a substantial body of evidence, basically, that's, that indicates that uh, community integration is very important for individuals with disabilities, but they continue to be marginalized by social, economic, political, and, and environmental um, structures. A full community integration is dependent on the extent to which individuals with disabilities are able to participate in the activities of daily living in the normative community physical environment. Um, and access to transportation is not only an activity of daily living for individuals with disabilities, as, <laughs> as all individuals, but it also supports participation in activities of daily living, um, or ADLs, uh, they'd be called. But so it's kind of a double whammy kind of thing. Uh, so transportation disadvantaged populations such as individuals with disabilities um, experience lower rates of access to employment, education, health services, and other community resources, uh, recreation, lots of uh, different things. Um, so transportation, uh, um, the disability community sees transportation as one of kind of their top three um, uh, critical factors. Uh, for community integrations with housing and employment and transportation, and they're all related. Um, those are the uh, ones that are focused on very much. So understanding the relationship between transportation access and individuals with disabilities, transportation needs kind of a, a, an important step that needs to be taken. So this study was really to, there, there's not a lot in the literature um, so this study was to examine the relationship between fixed route bus and light rail service for UTA. Um, uh, fixed 
fixed route bus and light rail service in the Wasatch Front. The Wasatch Front's about four counties uh, around the Salt Lake area, Davis, Weber, Salt Lake, and Utah counties. Um, and then the spatial temporal organization of individuals with disabilities activities of daily living within that same area. Uh, so what we were, um, basically we were kind of using a methodology similar to that that's used by like Curry and or Amoroso. Um, but we're comparing two measures to identify the, the need supply shortfalls for spatial gaps uh, to try and improve, improve spatial um, planning or transportation system planning. And we're working um, with uh, UD, uh, UTA uh, to do this, which is why uh, we're a little slower than we would like to be because we added a couple things in. So, um, so the study objectives um, include uh, putting together an index of public transportation provision, um, just a uh, topological accessibility index to represent the fixed route bus and uh, light rail service patterns. And we'll demonstrate those, um, or I'll talk about more about those in a second, as well as developing um, an index of transportation need, which represents the spatial temporal organization of individuals with disabilities activities of daily living. Um, and then we're basically comparing those two with the, the supply and the need. And the, the, the point of this one is, is instead of just looking at demand uh, for the transportation planning, it's about need. Uh, what uh, we're uh, uh, expecting the, the need to be. Um, with, as a collaboration between UTA and, the, um, and this, this project, um, Putting out a survey now, um, which has slowed down, slowed us down just a little bit. So, but um, we are basically surveying individuals with disabilities to determine um, their stated needs and ask a number of questions. And that survey uh, is actually to occur mid-August. It had to wait until then. It, it was interesting. Um, there's no data collected on the ridership of individuals with disabilities. Like they don't know when they're riding the fixed route systems or not. Um, it's just kind of anecdotal information. Um, and uh, mid-August basically will be kind of their peak time for ridership of the fixed route system as schools come back into session and they, they have their ridership peak. Um, there was the assumption that that would also be the peak for individuals with disabilities, but like the ADA coordinator for UTA and a few others just indicated anecdotally um, that there's not really that change for individuals with disabilities. It's fairly constant throughout the year. So we're asking some questions to try and determine that and then to really, um, it's a 22 question survey, uh, although one of the questions is, would you like a Visa gift card for participating? So that's not as helpful. But um, um, so, but we are asking some of these uh, questions to help uh, narrow down the need, um, and then that will basically uh, feed into the remainder of the study. So the transportation provision. I should also state that we're not looking at paratransit service; um, it's the fixed route service. Uh, uh, looking at that. Uh, so basically, this is calculated um, for each set for census block groups, or what we're using. For each census block group, we basically calculate the total sum of the transit stops by the service mode, um, and then weighted by the frequency of the stop, and it was to be, the, and the population of the census block group that's being considered. Um, the measure considers the number of passengers each stop is capable of absorbing in relative terms to the population. Uh, uh, what we refine this a little bit in that we're looking at the number of stops for the population and weighting it by vehicle capacity um, with the current ridership. So UTA was able to provide ridership data um, as people are getting on and off of each stop and we can look at excess capacity uh, of each vehicle uh, so that we could refine that just a little bit more and then stop frequency so we could start to play around with this for planning purposes to see if we can increase stop frequency or um, 
how much excess capacity there happened to be on each uh, conveyance. So, um, doing that essentially provides us, um, you know, spatially for each census census block group, um, how much uh, capacity there is uh, or provision there is for each of the census block groups. So that's the supply, uh, the which which we're using. Then the transportation need, there's been a number of factors for transportation advantage or disadvantage. Um, it's basically the weighted sum of these standardized indicators, um, which represent a number of those. The specific ones that we are using um, are broken down into basically social factors and spatial factors. Um, and they're somewhat different from this list that I'm showing you here, but we have the percentage or percent of each census block group's population who are individuals with disabilities, um, who are elderly, um, who are eight years of age and under uh, for, uh, with children, um, the percentage of each census block group's population who are unemployed and have uh, less than a high school education and are below 100% of the federal poverty uh, uh, level which is about just over $12,000 annually per person. And that relates to basically the Horizon Access Card uh, for uh, subsidy for writing uh, UTA services. Um, also the individual, the percent of, the popu of that particular area's population with no vehicle access. We're looking at all these factors, but then running, uh, have been running principal component analysis on them to determine which ones um, uh, the weighted importance of those and then using the, the unweighted uh, ones that um, uh, the unweighted important variables from that. Um, the spatial factors we're looking at access to um, or distance to employment centers within that census block group, um, education, recreation, health services, and other goods and services. Um, and then also looking at incivilities or um, crime patterns and rates within each census block group to, to try and identify basically that, that aspect of a safe, um, safe environment for accessing the UTA services. So that, um, looking at those, basically we're ending up with, and this part of the study is not complete uh, at this point as we're waiting on some of the survey data to help um, refine some of these as well. But uh, we would end up with this uh, uh, index of um, need for each census block group. And then simply we're comparing them to see where uh, the, the, the uh, provision and the need, you know, the, the, what the supply is to get an index of despair to see if there's unmet need, um, what we can do to better meet those needs, um, whether it re requires other stops, increased frequency, um, what uh, what has to occur so um, the implications of that uh, was in addition to having more transit stops or higher transit frequency specific measures such as services adapted for um, individuals with disabilities benefits for advanced ticket purchase discounts for um, individuals who are unemployed and uh, safe public bus service um, spaces and locations can directly and positively affect variables such as uh, the instability rates, unemployment, and illiteracy because accessibility to jobs, education, and health services would improve. Um, this is about the disability experience. So these measures must be accompanied by policies to lower the, the rates of instabilities, uh, uh, unemployment or employment opportunities. Um, increased uh, transportation supply alone is not really enough to reduce uh, the dis disadvantage that individuals with disabilities face, um, but it can have a, a very strong impact, especially when it's uh, coordinated with other um, opportunities and uh, policy measures. So the research findings um, have significance for uh, the transportation system planning in this area and are supporting UTA's efforts to implement more socially sustainable public transportation 
Um, and the findings will be used to demonstrate uh, methods as well for this type of spatial um, equity planning in transportation planning to better meet the needs of transportation disadvantaged individuals such as individuals with disabilities. So, are there any questions that anyone might have? So, yeah. Uh, uh, pardon me, will you ask that question again? I, I don't hear very well. We are actually pulling, like the crime data in civilities is coming from the law enforcement agencies of each of the four counties. Um, they basically had to provide that data. Um, some, some, uh, there have been a couple of other kind of somewhat similar studies, and they were using actually um, homicide uh, data, but there's not a lot of homicides in Salt Lake area, so we're actually looking at vandalism and graffiti um, occurrences from the database. So we're using that, we're using census data, um, we're using ridership data from UTA, um, and we are also using um, employment data from some of the disability service providers in that area from some of the independent living um, centers that are pro uh, providing services in most counties. Other, other questions? Okay, yeah. Oh, this is the Utah Transit Utah Transit Authority. Oh, yeah. as soon as you said that, I was like, "You, you are? I don't recognize." There is public transport. Okay, sorry. I was, I was very confused. You know, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean. Yeah, okay, yeah. And, and we are, so our survey, we're collecting data on the paratransit service as well as the fixed route service in this area. But, I mean, the paratransit's at capacity. I mean, it, it, it's used at, you know, whatever you pr provide. So we're looking to say, well, what can we do with fixed route service uh, to better meet needs? Because in some respect, I mean, my own family members using paratransit, you know, it'll be a, five minute drive or a 10 minute bus ride and paratransit will take you door to door but sometimes because of the demand on that service it'll take an hour mm -hmm. to get there. Um, Yeah. And we should we could probably talk. So some of the questions in our two of the questions in our survey are about um, some of these ride sharing kinds of services. So, yeah. How are you partnering with like anchor institutions on this? I mean, looking at your local health systems and your school systems to try and understand where their populations are and where their pockets of needs are and what those transportation patterns look like. Are you doing those things? You know, and we haven't been uh, partnering with like the health services. What we've been partnering with are, are the disability service pro providers in that area. So we're getting some of that uh, information or feedback from them from the disability aspect of it. But we haven't gone to like the school or the 
actually the health provider. I haven't talked with him yet. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um,